Hello, and welcome to Audio Echoes, a books on cassette series produced by Vista Media. These two cassettes feature Dr. Ross Campbell's book, How to Really Know Your Child. Dr. Campbell practices psychiatry in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and is associate professor in the departments of pediatrics and psychiatry at the University of Tennessee College of Medicine. He is also the author of the best-selling books, How to Really Love Your Child and How to Really Love Your Teenager. Dr. Campbell shares from his personal and professional experience on how to be an effective Christian parent. He provides helpful insights on such vital topics as giving unconditional love to your child, effectively demonstrating your Christianity to your child, recognizing your child's personality type, dealing with your child's anger, and using proper Christian discipline. This cassette adaptation will be useful not only for parents, but also for anyone who works with children. The material on these cassettes may intensify your interest in better knowing your child or children. If so, we recommend that you read through the book itself for additional insight. It is available at your local Christian bookstore or from Victor Books, 1825 College Avenue, Wheaton, Illinois, 60187. This book is being read by Ted Seeley, a dedicated professional in Christian communication. We hope you enjoy his presentation of Dr. Ross Campbell's book, How to Really Know Your Child. Chapter 1. Will Your Children Carry on Your Faith? John and Mary Perkins stepped nervously into my office. I glanced at my appointment schedule. The notation underneath said that they had a 15-year-old unmarried pregnant daughter. You came in to talk about your daughter, Anne. Tell me about her, I said. Tears welled up in the mother's eyes. Oh, Dr. Campbell, she's only fifteen, and she's pregnant. What are we going to do? We did everything we knew to be good parents to Anne. We've both worked for years to give her and our other children the good things in life. We took her to Sunday school and church. We gave her piano lessons, and we sent her to summer camp. But how are we going to handle this? I just don't know where we went wrong, John Perkins added. She goes against everything her mother and I try to do for her. I realized that they really loved Anne, but communicated their feelings to her by giving her material things. They honestly felt that this would make up for not being able to spend time with her. Then I spoke with Anne. My suspicions were confirmed. Anne did not feel her parents loved her. She did not feel she was important to them. John, Mary, and Anne came for counseling on a weekly basis. At first, few things were openly stated. Anne usually had little to say. She was obviously angry and frustrated. But after two or three weeks, she began to open up. Remember the night of the mother-daughter banquet, Mom? Anne asked. You couldn't be there because you had to go with Daddy to that accountant's seminar. I was the only one there without a mother. But Anne, Mary interrupted. I bought you that lovely yellow dress for the banquet. I thought you didn't mind that I went with Daddy. Well, I did. You guys just never seem to be around when I need you. Gradually, both John and Mary began to understand their daughter's feelings. They realized that the things they had given Anne could not begin to replace the love and personal attention she really needed from them. Anne's story typifies far too many of today's families. Parents become so involved in their own problems that they forget to stop and talk or listen to their children. As a result, many children are angry and depressed because their emotional needs are not being met. These young people simply turn outside their homes for need satisfaction. A damaging involvement in drugs, sex, lying, cheating, or stealing is almost certain for a teen who feels unloved by his parents. Why are fewer and fewer young people continuing in the faith? The answer lies in the way we are raising our children. We do not really know our children. We are not communicating our true feelings to them. We are not letting them know that we love them unconditionally. If you love your child unconditionally, you love him no matter what his handicaps, assets, or liabilities are. Unconditional love means you love your child, but you do not always love his behavior. Any child who has less than unconditional love from his parents will be an angry, frustrated child. Let's go back and look at Anne's reaction to feeling unloved. What did she do? 
she sought love elsewhere and became pregnant. She was angry with her parents and went against them and their spiritual values. I want to emphasize, spirituality is not something which should be kept separate and apart from all other aspects of your child's life. Spirituality is just one part of the whole person, and it is very much influenced by the rest of the personality. The way you help your child handle anger, frustration, and his natural anti-authority behavior during the teen years will affect him spiritually in exactly the same way it affects him physically, emotionally, and psychologically. You cannot force your child into accepting spiritual values if he does not feel your love and concern. Many Christian leaders today are telling parents to administer harsh disciplinary actions and break the stubborn wills of children who misbehave. The results of such authoritarian teachings are angry children rebelling from the faith in which they were nurtured. Almost every day I talk with children and teenagers who are hurting because they do not feel loved. And the sad thing about it all is that Christian parents think they are doing the right thing. Society is screaming at our kids to satisfy their physical desires. But society is standing empty-handed when it comes to helping them grow spiritually, emotionally, or intellectually. So it's up to parents to become aware of these needs and meet them at home. The first step in doing this is to offer your child unconditional love. Only then will he develop into a self-confident, capable young adult ready to adopt the lifestyle of his parents including their spiritual values. Our national morality has reached an all-time low in the last 25 years. Teens today are bombarded with information that teens 25 years ago hardly knew existed. With today's economic conditions forcing both parents into the workforce, teens are receiving unheard of freedom and less and less parental guidance. It's up to us parents to look deeply into our relationships with our teenage children. It's up to us to admit our weaknesses, try to understand them, and begin to work toward improvement. A strong, Christ-centered, love-based relationship with our kids will make the difference between Christian and non-Christian adulthood. Christian parents are searching for help in developing their children into spiritual adults. The problem is that they are receiving wrong information. Many of today's Christian writers are so overzealous about helping parents get their child into church that they tend to overlook the whole child. They deal only with disciplining the child about spiritual matters. Parents are told to force their children to do their bidding, and all else will fall into place, including spirituality. Exactly the opposite is true. When you force a child, you anger him, and an angry child will become anti-authority and will go exactly opposite the desired direction. Another problem is that many parents feel that they already know all there is to know about child-rearing. These are the parents who are difficult to reach. These are the parents who need to honestly question their ideas and weed out those that are unbiblical. The advice I'm offering in this book is based on 18 years of working with children. It's offered because of my sincere and anxious concern for the future of the church and the family. The sad truth is all around us. Young people are not adopting their parents' spiritual values. They are going in exactly the opposite direction, a direction which is depleting Christianity in the United States today. I suggest that you set a goal of Christian adulthood for your child and then lovingly guide him toward that end. It won't be easy. I'm not offering you 12 simple steps to raising spiritual sons and daughters. I'm offering advice to sincere Christian parents who want for their children the meaning and fulfillment which only Christianity can provide. Chapter 2. Parent, Know Thyself Knowing who you are and how you feel about yourself plays a very important part in how you interact with your children. Ellen's story will enable you to more fully understand the importance of self-knowledge especially self-esteem. I was born into a family of 12 children. My problem developed because I always wanted everyone to be peaceful. I was forever trying to settle disputes which occurred daily in our large household. For as long as I can remember, I really felt awful if I couldn't settle an argument, if I couldn't restore calm. Then another problem attitude developed within me. 
Maybe it was because I was the baby in the family, but I felt that no one really took me seriously. I was just the cute little baby sister, and if I didn't complete an assigned task, someone else would. I gradually began to realize that my actions or lack of actions did not have the same impact as those of my siblings. And so I went into adulthood carrying these odd notions in my mind, feeling worse and worse about not keeping constant peace among my siblings, and feeling less and less that anything I did was important. I took these attitudes with me into marriage and parenting. When my husband and I disagreed, I would always be the first to want to restore peace. I taught him very quickly that his word was much more important than mine, that I really didn't amount to all that much. Without realizing it, I gave our first two children the peace at all costs and low self-esteem messages and tried to train them to act the same way. And I topped it all off by setting their dad up as the total authority figure. Our little family struggled along for about 12 years, and then one day I started crying. I knew I had to have professional help. I'm one of the lucky parents. I finally got acquainted with myself in time to salvage my family and my marriage. I know now that the only way to be an effective parent is to really know and love yourself. Many times I've seen how the personal problems of parents can cause serious damage to their children. As a general rule, parents with low self-esteem will affect their children negatively. It is extremely important for a mother and father to take an honest look at themselves and discover who they are. Self-confidence and self-worth must be evident at all times so that the children can learn to develop these same traits. If you are constantly pessimistic and exhibit negative, irresponsible behavior, you are promoting an anti-authority lifestyle to your child. Teenagers, constantly influenced by anti-authority parents, are placed in double jeopardy because they are already by nature anti-authority. In many marriages, the basic problem is selfishness. And no wonder, for the prevailing attitude of today is meism. What's more, the absence of moral values in society makes it very easy to become involved with someone else and simply walk out of a marriage. Craig Reed sat defiantly across from me, his body slightly turned away from his wife Fran. They were both bright young people, but they were seriously considering a divorce. I have my work and a couple of interesting hobbies, Craig said. Fran never wants to do anything with me. She just stays home with the kids. I keep telling her that she can get a weekend sitter for the kids and we can go boating or climbing. And I keep telling him that we don't have much time to spend with the kids as it is, Fran interrupted. I think he's being just plain selfish. Not only does he want to do just what he enjoys, he insists that I do what he enjoys too. After working all week, I need a little time just for me, and the kids need us too. Fran turned directly toward her husband. Craig, you are a very selfish person. Craig, I interjected, how do you feel about being called selfish? Do you see yourself as a selfish person? No, I never thought I was selfish. I make a good living and give Fran and the boys a lot. I don't think that's being selfish. Fran seemed to be pleading now. Craig, you give plenty of things to the boys, but so little of yourself. I just can't stand to see them hurt any more. Craig fell back in his chair. I guess she's right, Dr. Campbell. I don't pay much attention when she tries to rearrange my weekends. It took a few months of counseling, but Craig acquired a different perspective of himself. Often a third party can be the answer. That's why it's good to seek professional help when you have problems. A marriage based on Jesus Christ is a beautiful, strong marriage. Obedience to Christ in a marital relationship means a lifelong selfless commitment to each other and the children of that marriage. When we put the needs of our spouse and our children before our own desires, our needs are met by God and family members. It is a beautiful cycle. No marriage is always easy and perfect. But when problems do arise, a Christian marriage has the power of God at its disposal. Children have to see proper behavior lived out before their eyes, before they can understand and copy it. Far too many parents follow the old axiom, do as I say, not as I do, and then don't understand why their children rebel against what they say. 
It's hard to educate your children in matters of right and wrong if you are doing one thing and saying another. Look at the parent who cheats on his income tax returns every year and then becomes totally irate when he finds that his child has cheated on a test at school. What a confused kid. He was just doing what his father taught him to do. And what in the world is this same kid going to do about spirituality if his parents preach it but don't live it? I think Titus chapter 1 verse 16 aptly describes the situation. They claim to know God, but by their actions they deny Him. It is the action of denial that your children will copy. The verbal demands that you make in trying to discipline them into a Christian lifestyle will only create in them feelings of rebellion and confusion. They will move away from Christianity. What you speak must come from your heart and be evident in your daily life. We all go through phases in our spiritual growth. When we first become Christians, we are excited and on fire for the Lord. We are wide open for teaching, and we grow by leaps and bounds in our Christian knowledge. Then we enter the either black or white phase. We become very rigid and feel that everything pertaining to our faith has to be only one way, either totally black or totally white. This is a stage of spiritual immaturity, but everyone goes through it. Many become discouraged because the rigid things, the pat answers they learn through their either black or white stage, do not always apply to all of life's experiences. A perfect example of this is trying to cope with the complexities of raising teenagers. There are simply no nice pat answers for every problem that arises. Try to determine your current phase of spiritual growth. If you are still in the rigid phase, you will adversely affect your children. One of the most important traits a parent, especially of teenagers, must possess is flexibility. Flexibility does not mean permissiveness. It means not being rigid in your expectations, but remaining pleasant, positive, and firm as you guide your children in the decision-making process. For example, one young mother recently told me how proud she was that all three of her daughters were taking dancing lessons. I absolutely insisted that they all take dancing, she said. Unfortunately, she didn't ask the girls if they really wanted to dance. The oldest one wanted to take swimming lessons instead, but went dutifully to dance class every Saturday morning. How much happier this girl would have been if she could have been dropped off at the pool while her sisters danced. But the mother wasn't flexible. Chances are this is not a particularly happy home. And that's unfortunate, for above all, we must make our homes havens for our children. They must be places where our sons and daughters feel secure, relaxed, and loved. It's very hard for a parent in the either black or white phase of spirituality to achieve such an atmosphere. When many Christians emerge from the either black or white stage and realize no absolute answers exist for most problems, they are faced with the danger of becoming cynical. They begin to realize that living a Christian life is difficult. They see that they must spend time with the Lord and daily ask for His leading. The danger at this point is that one can become very disillusioned. Unfortunately, this occurs for most parents about the same time that their kids are teenagers, the time when their kids need the most stability in their lives. And here we are as parents having a hard time with many of our own thoughts and beliefs. It is during times like these that we must hang ferociously to our faith. It is perfectly normal for your teenagers to see you struggle as long as you don't choose anti-authority, cynical solutions to your problems. Adopting that kind of attitude will immediately kill the spiritual growth of your children. They need to see you working toward positive biblical solutions to your problems. When you finally get through this difficult phase of your spirituality, you then enter your spiritual adolescence. It's a real questioning time in your life. You question churches and, in a healthy way, question your own faith. This is real growth. This is the time when you really begin to find out things on your own. You begin reading Scripture with a new light. You begin interpreting it against your own experiences and not the experiences of others. The danger in this phase is that we tend to forget that our children have not gone through this or any other phase of Christianity. If you try to explain your attitude toward your spiritual life to your children now, 
you will really confuse them. So what you must do is make your spiritual attitudes continually obvious to your children in your daily life. I know these suggestions are not always easy, but I do know that they will pay off in the long run for both you and your children. And so, if you always give careful thought to your ways and present them in a Christ-centered manner, you are giving your best to your children. Chapter 3, 25 Percenters Becoming totally aware of your child's personality is the most crucial thing you can do in order to help him develop into a strong Christian adult. I have found it practical to separate people by the way they respond to authority and place them in two categories. Approximately 25% are basically pro-authority, about 75% are generally anti-authority. I have two sons, David and Dale. Dale is my 25 percenter, and David is my 75 percenter. Dale was born asking, Dad, is there anything you and Mom would like me to do? And David arrived with an order to all in hearing distance, Would you people please step out of the way? I have a life to live, and I would like to get on with it with as little interference as possible. Each of the boys has his pros and cons and each possesses a little of the good and the bad, which offers both problems and joys in raising them. Basically, how a child responds to almost anything depends on his attitude toward authority, and his attitude toward authority depends on his personality. When we understand the personalities of our children, we can better understand our children's behavior and emotions and possibly keep from making some tragic mistakes in raising them. Twenty-five percenters are born with a need to be under authority. They want approval and praise. They want somebody to tell them what to do and to structure their time for them. They want somebody to make decisions for them. Where the 75 percenters strike out on their own and begin thinking for themselves almost from day one, the 25 percenters have to be taught to think for themselves. They have a terrible handicap as adults because they are always expecting somebody else to tell them what to do. Twenty-five percenters can be easily controlled with guilt because they are so prone to guilt. Most parents of twenty-five percenters control their children in exactly this manner without realizing it, and then take great pride in the fact that they have such wonderfully disciplined children. Julie Hyde, fourteen-year-old daughter of Evelyn and Richard Hyde, is a perfect example of a twenty-five percenter controlled by guilt. Julie is the oldest of the five Hyde children. She is a quiet, obedient 25 percenter. A few weeks ago, a friend invited her to a swimming party. Mom, Carla is having a swimming party this evening and wants me to come. Is it all right with you? Oh, I'm sorry, Julie. I had planned to have dinner with your dad. I was looking forward to it. I'd hoped you could watch your brothers and sisters for me. Oh, well, never mind. I'll do it another time. Julie knew that her mother rarely got out of the house, but she really wanted to go to that swimming party. However, she would have felt terrible being the one to keep her mom from some much-needed time away from the kids. Go ahead, Mom. My swimsuit's faded anyway. I'd rather wait till I get a new one before I go to a swimming party. I can stay here. Parents who are controlling their children with guilt, as Evelyn Hyde did Julie, are controlling them in the worst possible way. Even though such control is totally unintentional, it still occurs. What these parents don't realize is that 25 percenters are keeping all their feelings to themselves. They are extremely self-critical. A 25 percenter has such high expectations of himself that every day is a disappointment to him, because every day something goes wrong. Such a child is obviously prone to depression, and depression causes anger. Keeping in mind that a 25 percenter wants above all to please, he will keep his anger inside, causing even deeper depression. He has not been taught how to think for himself or express his feelings outwardly and verbally. As a consequence, he's going to be a depressed and angry adult. The natural need for all humans to be loved and feel self-worth is multiplied in the 25 percenter personality. So when his parents do not realize his low self-esteem, he goes outside his home for need satisfaction. Denise came to see me about eight months ago. She said, Dr. Campbell, I attended a lecture on anorexia this afternoon, 
and it made me realize that I am anorexic and bulimic. I don't want to tell my parents because they don't think I've done much of anything right in my life as it is. As I began to counsel Denise, her problem unfolded. Her older brother Bill was outgoing and aggressive. Denise was the quiet one. Ever since I can remember, Bill had mom's or dad's attention about something, Denise began. When he was about seven years old, he developed a life-threatening illness. I stayed with my grandparents while he was in the hospital. I really got lonesome there, but I hated to bother mom and dad because I knew they were upset about Bill. She told me that she almost always gave in to anyone who crossed her. However, when she started to high school, she changed. Oh, I still tried to keep peace at home, but I was a real character at school. When I was a junior, I went out with a boy who was just plain trouble. I didn't tell Mom and Dad that I was going out with him, but they found out. They lectured me for two weeks. I never went out with that kid again. Again, I felt very guilty because I did something that displeased my parents so. I thought I was probably the worst person in the world. Denise went from high school to college and failed college. I lied to Mom and Dad, telling them that my grade report must have been lost in the mail. One day Mom surprised me and came to visit me at school. I couldn't stand it any longer. I broke down and cried and told Mom the truth. I hadn't been attending classes. I'd just been hanging around campus goofing off. Mom didn't yell at me. She just called Dad, and he came and moved me home. They told me I would have to get a job and pay them back the money I'd wasted on my education. I held two or three different jobs, finally succeeding in paying back the money, but I had no particular direction. All this time, Mom was directing my life. I resented her interference, but I couldn't afford to move away from home, so I had to put up with it. When I told her that I was going to finish my education, she offered to loan me the money. I refused the loan. I knew that I was either going to have to do something on my own soon, or I never would. So I borrowed the money and moved out of my parents' house and started back to school. As time for graduation drew closer and closer, I panicked. I had never completed anything of importance before, and I was afraid I probably wouldn't complete this. I had always been slightly overweight, so I started on a diet. And soon I discovered that I could lose weight easily. At last, I was doing something right. The only problem was that it became an obsession with me. After intensive counseling with Denise, she began to understand what kind of person she was, a 25 percenter. But Denise's 25 percent personality was not recognized by her parents, and they hadn't interacted with her accordingly. Fortunately, the story of Denise has a happy ending. She graduated third in her class and is now working in a large hospital in the Midwest. She and her parents have a real relationship these days. Her parents now realize that just because she's quiet and demands little attention doesn't mean she needs no attention from them. You can see how simple it was for Denise's parents to control her, but her lack of emotional fulfillment resulted in anger and frustration which turned inward. We must be very careful about the spiritual lives of our 25 percenters, but in the process not ignore their emotional, physical, and psychological health. We must recognize the times when they feel anger and teach them to express it openly. We must express unconditional love, especially during the anti-authority period so natural to the teenage years. By doing these things, we can be assured that our quiet little 25 percenters will mature into strong, healthy adults who love the Lord as we do. Chapter 4, 75 Percenters I knew when David was about two that he was a 75 percenter. He was definitely one of those, I'd rather do it myself, children. We've never had to wonder whether or not David was angry. He has always been able to let us know. But Dale, our 25 percenter, is different. My wife Pat and I try to be watchful and help Dale express his anger when we know something is bothering him. 75 percenters want to do their own thinking. They want to make their own decisions. They want to learn the hard way and to control their own behavior. They can become angry when someone tries to tell them what to do. 
On the surface, the 75 percenter appears much harder to raise than the 25 percenter, but he's not. He may seem more difficult because he already has an inborn desire to think for himself. This is a God-given talent. It is the reason that 75 percenters are natural leaders. It is a lot easier to keep your thumb on a 75 percenter and help him keep his behavior under control than it is to teach the 25 percenter how to think on his own. Most Christians tend to be 25 percenters. Because there are so few 75 percenters in the church, when one does show up, he automatically becomes a leader. This can hurt the church because we don't have enough 75 percenters to achieve a balance. Any leader who has no competition or feedback listens only to himself and gets more and more caught up in his own ideas. This helps explain why so many churches teach extremely authoritarian doctrine. The danger of this is that most of these leaders advocate the same thing about raising children and teenagers. They say that the primary way of relating to a child is by disciplining him, especially by beating him with the rod. Verses in Proverbs dealing with authoritarian discipline are used as proof texts for this school of thought, but they are used with no balance. This misguided teaching is one of the main reasons why so many 75 percenters turn against the church. By the time they are 17 or 18, they are still angry because of their authoritarian upbringing. The 25 percenter, on the other hand, is more likely to make a commitment to Christ and join the church regardless of how he's treated because he needs to be under authority. I'm not going to church today, our 13-year-old David stated flatly one Sunday morning a few years ago. I could see that it was useless to talk him into going. He was so determined about the matter that forcing him would have created a destructive, anti-church, anti-spiritual attitude that could be extremely difficult to reverse. Do you like Sunday school, I asked. Yeah, I don't mind Sunday school. Okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. You go to Sunday school, and your mother and I will take turns taking you home during church. David agreed to the concept. Knowing that David is a 75 percenter, which makes him naturally anti-authority, we chose for the moment not to pressure him and lose him from the church permanently. This new arrangement went on for about four or five weeks, and then I could see it was getting old for David. He knew that Pat and I wanted to be in church together, that we needed to be in church. So finally he said, I'll go to church for your sake, and that was that. If you really get acquainted with your child and trust your instincts, you'll be able to handle your particular situation. The key is to keep things positive and try not to become too authoritarian with your 75 percenter. Jane is definitely a 75 percenter, born to a very definite 75 percenter mother. As a little girl, she constantly exhibited her anti-authority nature. But her mother kept the upper hand and would almost always see to it that Jane did exactly as she was told. Jane was anti-academics, anti-church, anti-authority in general. She was very anti-social and made only one or two friends. When she moved away and entered college, she quit going to church. Jane made good enough grades in college to graduate with a degree in nursing and immediately went to work in a large metropolitan hospital where she met and married a doctor. This marriage produced two children but ended in a bitter divorce. After her divorce, she met and married quiet, steady Fred. He offered her sons, who were now teenagers, all the love and support he could give them. He was patient with Jane's angry, anti-everything nature. Fred encouraged Jane to try to develop some kind of a positive relationship with her parents, especially her mother. During one of these visits back to her hometown, a visit when she was attempting to heal some of the wounds of the past, Jane shared this realization with a longtime friend. One night, in my attempt to console my son, I let him know that even when we are at our lowest, there is hope. I realized that my words truly were empty without God. Right then and there, I came to the full understanding that I couldn't encourage him to feel confident in himself unless I had a strong belief in something that could give me hope. And that something is God. After all these years, I have to admit that Mother was right, at least about God. It is so sad that Jane's mother didn't understand her daughter's personality, and even her own, 
so that they could have been spared the pain they both suffered all those years. Unless we know who we are as parents, and unless we become intimately acquainted with our children, we can unintentionally do irreparable damage. Understanding each personality is the key to understanding how to handle each individual situation. Now that you know whether you have a 25 percenter or a 75 percenter, you are armed with a tremendous amount of help to guide that child through life into spiritual adulthood. Spirituality will surely develop in the child whose parents have bothered to learn about his particular idiosyncrasies and have taken the time to show him that they love him unconditionally. Chapter 5, A Generation of Angry Kids What's for supper, Mom? 14-year-old Tommy asked as he tossed his books and ball glove on the kitchen table. I haven't fixed any supper, Tom, his mother answered. I have to work at the office this evening. Oh, brother, I hate to cook. You'll do fine. Don't be so grouchy. How was ball practice? Fine, Tommy snapped as he slammed the skillet down on the stove. You wouldn't care even if it went terrible, he muttered. Watch your tongue, young man. You don't have to get upset just because you have to fix two hamburgers. I don't want to hear any more out of you. Tommy's dad walked in the back door. Hey, look who's fixing supper. Yeah, Mom has to go to work. Hey, what's the trouble? You sound kind of moody. I had a lousy ball practice, Dad. Nothing went right. Hold on, Tom. I don't want to hear you complain about baseball. If you can't take a little static from the coach, then I suggest you just drop out of the program. You're a good player, and you know it, so quit complaining. That's just it, Dad. At practice today, I didn't do so well. I don't want to hear anything about it. Either quit complaining or quit baseball. This mood of yours is not something I want to put up with all evening. But, Dad, I'm only trying to tell you. At practice today, no more talk about practice. Go to your room, and I'll call you when supper's ready. All of us have felt anger and have felt the need to release that anger by yelling at or talking to someone. All Tommy wanted to do was to get his anger out, but his parents were too busy to listen. It happens to all of us, and we don't realize it. We get so involved in all our own lives that we don't take the time to listen to our children. Fortunately for Tommy and his parents, they resolved the problem the next morning. Any person will respond in an angry way if his emotional needs are not met as he expects they should be. Take a young child, for instance. When an infant is not fed the moment he wants to be fed, he becomes angry. As he gets a little older, he develops an emotional attachment to someone, usually his mother. If that person does not meet his needs, he becomes angry. Look at kids today. Mothers or other adults leave them for long periods of time and on a regular basis. This is one significant reason why kids are so angry today. They are not given the loving attention they need to keep that anger from happening. They have a need for an emotional attachment, but nobody is there to fill that need. The emotional needs of kids have to be met in certain behavioral ways by parents. They need positive eye contact, positive physical contact, focused attention, and loving discipline. Lack of emotional nurturing causes depression. Few people understand that a depressed child is an angry child, and the angrier he is, the likelier he is to become more depressed. It's a vicious cycle and can happen to any child regardless of his life experiences. We must allow our children to let their anger out instead of keeping it inside. Suppressed anger is a very dangerous thing. Passive aggressive behavior is suppressed anger that a child or an adult displays in a negative, albeit unconscious way. The purpose of passive aggressive behavior is to upset authority, to make authority figures angry. Some examples of passive aggressive behavior are forgetfulness, dawdling, lying, stealing, and chronic lateness. Passive aggressive behavior is hard to see at first because it's so subtle. An example of the subtlety of passive aggressive behavior is easy to see in children, especially teenagers, and their problems with grades. At the beginning of the school year, there's no reason for a student to be angry at the teacher or the school. He starts the school year doing well. However, as the year progresses, the normal aggravations of life cause anger to gradually build up inside him. He's very good at suppressing anger, 
But eventually, the anger level gets so great that it starts coming out in passive-aggressive behavior. The grades start going down. The student unconsciously thinks, I'm so angry with you that I won't do the work. Consciously, he wants to do as well as everyone else. Unconsciously, he's releasing suppressed anger in a passive-aggressive way in order to upset authority. Most 13, 14, or 15-year-olds are usually angry about something most of the time. What we must do is keep that anger coming out of their mouths instead of allowing them to keep it inside. It is a very difficult thing for parents to do because their natural inclination is to quiet their teenagers, suppress the kids' anger, and keep peace in the house. But would you rather have a son yelling at you or a son overdosed on drugs? Would you rather have a daughter harping and screaming or have a pregnant daughter? Suppressing anger is something like depressing an inflated balloon with a bulge in it. If you push the bulge in, it's going to come out somewhere else. So if we try to keep our children from expressing their anger, it will only pop out in some other area of their lives, in negative, usually passive-aggressive behavior. In passive-aggressive behavior, a teenager gets rid of anger by making his parents upset. So whatever upsets the parents most is what the kid is going to go for. In most Christian homes, the kid's passive-aggressive behavior is going to be targeted against spirituality. In non-Christian homes, generally the emphasis is on grades, so most passive-aggressive behavior starts out anti-academics, anti-learning. Either area can be very destructive in the long run. But what can we do to prevent such a result? First, we can avoid making big issues out of spiritual things and academics. Overemphasizing anything during these years is just handing the kid ammunition and saying, hey, here's how you can hurt me and yourself. Have at it. If your daughter's room is messy, it's a good place for you as a parent to put emphasis because it's a passive-aggressive behavior which will not hurt anybody. You want to make an issue only out of something that is unimportant and will not hurt the child. So go ahead and put emphasis on cleaning up that room. She'll eventually outgrow that anti-everything, passive-aggressive attitude and put her room in order again. But how much better for her to exhibit passive-aggressive behavior by keeping a messy room instead of going against spirituality or making low grades? In the young child and the young teenager, passive-aggressive behavior can be changed. We can teach our children to express their anger positively so that passive-aggressive behavior will not develop any more than it normally does in that stage of life. However, once the teen reaches the ages of 16 to 18, passive-aggressive behavior can solidify. At that point, it can be very difficult to change. Passive-aggressive adults will be the end result of today's kids if we don't start helping them deal with their anger now. The younger a child is, the more immaturely he will express his anger. As he matures, he should begin to learn to express his anger in a more positive way. I realize that many times parents are so tired that they simply want to tell their child to be quiet. But that is absolutely the worst thing to do. It only succeeds in cramming his anger deep inside him. An example of helping a teen deal with anger happened to a friend of ours whose teenager came home from school with a very low grade on a math test. Jerry walked into the house, threw his books on the front hall table, and stomped into the kitchen. Finding nothing in the refrigerator to please him, he slammed the door shut. Sure looks like you could keep something around here to eat, Mom, he growled. Okay, Jerry, that's about enough, said his mother. I know you're angry about something, but I doubt it's the lack of food in the refrigerator. I do appreciate the fact that you're getting your anger out, but let's try to settle down somewhat and get to the bottom of this. Did something go wrong at school today? Well, not unless you call a D on an important math test something wrong, he answered her sarcastically. Do you want to talk about it now or wait a little while? I don't understand this low grade, Mom, Jerry's voice softened. These problems look right to me. What do you think about talking to your teacher about this tomorrow? And maybe he can tell you why he marked them wrong. Jerry decided to talk with his teacher. The next evening, he was in a good mood. Guess what, Mom? You're right. My math teacher had made an error in grading my paper. I got a B on the test. 
It's important to understand that anger is inevitable. We must also realize that the more it builds up, the more destructive it can become. Therefore, we must help our teens nip it in the bud if the anger is based on a misunderstanding, or if the anger is justified, verbally vent it in a slow, positive way so that it can be resolved. This method of anger resolution does not come naturally to anyone. We as parents must patiently train our teens to manage their anger in a mature way. Chapter 6 Christian Discipline I get very upset when I read child-rearing books written by prominent Christian leaders who advocate hitting, yelling, and pinching as ways to keep children under control. These writers lightly pass over the basic need of the child, which is a need for unconditional love and acceptance. To administer loving discipline is to train the child in the way he should go. It does not mean forcing the child to go the way you want him to go. Even before you can train your child in the way he should go, he must have and feel from you unconditional love. A child who feels unloved is an angry child, and an angry child will not respond to any kind of discipline in a positive way. Originally, the word discipline meant an instruction imparted to disciples. Today, most Christian child-rearing experts define discipline as control. They place minimal emphasis on first loving your child, and then they launch into instructions on how to control your child. If you can keep the original meaning of discipline in mind as you work with your children, it will be of great help to you. The first thing most of us think of when we hear the word disciple is Christ's disciples. The deepest wish of these twelve men was to be exactly like Christ. They would never have made such radical changes in their lives if they had not loved Him and felt His love in return. The beautiful example of Christ and His disciples clearly shows us that love and admiration are powerful motives for people to adopt another's values. This example can be followed by parents as they train their children in the way they should go. Once mutual love has been established, not only will your children adopt your general lifestyle, but they will want to adopt your spiritual values. Discipline, then, is training the child. Physical punishment is only one part of discipline, and if the child has had his emotional needs met, a very small part. It makes me sad to see people emphasize the four verses from Proverbs, which deal with using the rod, and then see them virtually ignore Scripture, which deals with a child's most basic need, love. Hundreds of verses in the Bible instruct us to be understanding, compassionate, sensitive, nurturing, and forgiving. Our children are very deserving, and they have every right to these expressions of love. An unfortunate consequence of corporal punishment is that it alleviates guilt. Too much guilt can be damaging to a child, but he must learn to feel some guilt in order to develop a conscience. A spanking will clear the air, that is certain. The child feels no guilt because he's paid for his wrongdoing by being spanked. However, the lesson learned by the child is not that his misbehavior is wrong, only that he shouldn't get caught at it the next time. What you really want for your child is for him to develop a normal, healthy conscience. This will help him control future actions. Feeling guilty once in a while will aid in this development. So the next time your child misbehaves, give him time to feel some good, honest guilt for his wrongdoing. When a child misbehaves, the first thing we should ask ourselves is, why did this child take this action? Our first thought should not be a negative one such as, what can I do to correct this child's behavior? Teachers sometimes mishandle their students' negative actions. Not long ago, I was counseling Molly, who told me of a very painful experience she had with her teacher. Molly had been late for school three mornings in one week. On the third morning, her teacher punished her tardiness by making her crawl to her desk. Then he struck her hands with a ruler. This was an extreme action and one which proved painfully embarrassing for Molly. Had the teacher bothered to check, he would have found that the reason she had been late was because the street on her usual route to school had been closed. He would also have discovered that both of her parents worked, and she was left alone each morning to get herself ready for school. 
If only Molly had been able to give her reasons before such stern punishment was administered, she might not have needed counseling. I'm not advocating that you condone misbehavior. Try instead to arrive at the reason for the misbehavior. Once that is accomplished, the misbehavior will be clearly understood and not likely repeated. Neither am I telling you to never spank your child. I'm simply suggesting that you put it on the very bottom of your list of productive and fair ways to deal with misbehavior, a last resort. I'm reminded of a little girl who lived in my neighborhood when I was a child. She had a pet kitten, which she treated as though it were human. One day, she tied a ribbon about its neck and turned it loose. The ribbon got caught in the shrubs and strangled the kitten. When her father found out about it, he spanked her and yelled at her in full view of us kids. I realize now that she needed some loving forgiveness for her actions. She never would have harmed that kitten on purpose. She needed to talk with her father in the privacy of their home and tell him how sorry she was and how bad she felt. She needed her father's forgiveness. Children need to feel forgiven when they are genuinely sorry for their actions. This helps them handle their guilt. Some guilt is necessary in order for the development of a conscience, but too much guilt can be very damaging. Punishment without unconditional love will result in a poor relationship between you and your child, and if it's allowed to develop by the time your child is an adult, he will not want to adopt any of your values. Young children have a need to admire their parents. These are the years, up to about age 13, that much productive groundwork can be laid for a solid relationship between you and your child. Focused attention during these years is very healthy for the child because it tells him that he is indeed very special. This is the time to teach and train the child's spiritual values and to emphasize them. As he matures, he will begin to question much of what his parents stand for. Still, he has the strong need, though it is sometimes unconscious, to be able to love and admire them. So it's obvious that a good self-disciplined example set by you as parents will greatly influence the child in a positive way. Your teen is going to challenge and or break some of the rules that you set for him. Since you know this is going to happen, the thing to do in the beginning is to make the rules quite strict and restrictive. Then, as your teen matures and demonstrates that he can be trusted to behave as the situation demands, his privileges will gradually increase and parental control will gradually lessen. In gradually removing restrictions and granting privileges, you are teaching your teen to become a responsible, trustworthy, independent adult by the age of 18. Your teen, whether he realizes it consciously or not, wants your guidance and control. I have heard many young people say that their parents don't love them because their mothers and fathers are not strict or firm with them. Teens must experience positive consequences for positive, responsible behavior and negative consequences for inappropriate, irresponsible behavior. These consequences must be consistent and fair, not based on how the parent is feeling at the time. If you clearly state to your teenager that you are working to help him become a responsible, independent person, he can then feel you are for him, not against him. Such a positive attitude will greatly improve your relationship. There are basically four types of discipline. The first is an authoritarian approach. The child is kept totally under control by his parents. He's offered no love, no eye contact, no physical contact, or focused attention. The second type of discipline is the authoritative method. This method, based on unconditional love, offers the child a lot of direction and correction when needed. He also receives emotional nurturing. Permissiveness is the third disciplining method. It offers the child love, attention, and support, but absolutely no direction. The parent who uses this method just goes along with whatever the child decides. The fourth method of dealing with a child is not to deal with him at all, neglect. Recently, a study was conducted on four groups of young adults, each of which had received one of the four types of discipline. The study revealed that the children who were raised under the authoritative method, where they not only received guidance, correction, and direction, but unconditional love, turned out the best. 
They not only identified with their parents' value system, but they made it through the anti-authority years and adopted the religious beliefs of mom and dad. The kids who turned out to be the most unsettled adults were raised in an authoritarian manner. This is the way most children in Christian homes are raised, and not surprisingly, most reject Christ. The next to the worst way of raising children is pure neglect, and the second best way of raising children is permissiveness. Aren't these findings amazing? Permissiveness, which is what Christian parents are strongly warned against, is superior to authoritarianism, which most Christian parents use. Even more annoying is the fact that the authoritarian method is worse than neglecting the child. This study affirms that the authoritative way of raising children is the most successful. Children who are lovingly disciplined and guided to adulthood will eventually not only adopt, but want to adopt their parents' spiritual values. Chapter 7, Children Want to Learn A red sports car pulled up in front of the church and stopped. Two little girls, about ages 8 and 10, hopped out. You two wait here on the church steps after Sunday school. Daddy and I will be back to get you at 11 o'clock. All right, Mommy, see you later. The children bounced up the steps and into the building while their parents sped away. They didn't want to be late for their tennis game. Does this scenario sound familiar? Children learn by parental example. What are these girls learning? Sadly, they are learning that just as soon as they are as old as Mommy and Daddy, they too can play tennis on Sunday mornings. These parents have probably told their children that they are Christians, but they are not living their spiritual statements. Children are most apt to respond to the value system that their parents live, and less likely to respond to what is told to them. Children are born ready to learn. In the early months of their lives, they have a built-in survival system. They let out a lusty yell to make their needs known. A popular current theory on child-rearing advises parents not to pick up a baby every time he cries because soon he will become spoiled. Actually, just the opposite happens. Babies who have been soothed at their every cry during their early months seem to develop into stronger, more self-confident children than babies who have been left to cry it out. When their needs are met during these first months, infants are learning that someone loves them. By meeting his needs, you are establishing a mutual trust between you and your child. As he develops from infancy into the toddler years, a good method of teaching your toddler that you trust him is allowing him to do simple chores. As you are putting away the pots and pans, allow him to put one away. Even though he places a pan on the wrong shelf in an upside-down position, compliment him. Let him know that you are very pleased about what he did. He is learning that you trust him and he is developing self-esteem. On a recent trip to the bookstore, I picked up a book on child-rearing written by a Christian author. I couldn't believe what I was reading. The author was telling his readers that it is not only permissible, but actually good for infants from four to five months to be reprimanded by loud verbal instruction. Now, raising your voice is sometimes necessary, but not in the nursery of a six-month-old infant. An example of the need to raise your voice is if your small child darts away from you into a heavily traveled street. Then you have to yell at him to possibly save his life. However, if you had been raising your voice at him since he was an infant, he quite probably wouldn't have paid any attention to you and would have continued on his way. Swiss scientist Jean Piaget theorized that the development of learning in children is divided into four stages. The age range of these stages is from birth to two years, from two to seven years, from seven to eleven years, and from eleven years on. Two to seven-year-olds believe exactly what their parents tell them. Indeed, until he gradually develops the ability to reason and question, a child takes most everything his parents say quite literally. Let me give you this amusing but true example. Three-year-old Adam sat quietly in the back seat of the car with his eight-year-old sister, Leanne. They were on their way home from the zoo. I have a headache, Leanne announced. I do too, interrupted Adam. Right here on my knuckle, he continued, pointing to the top of his head. Oh, Adam, your knuckle is on your hand, not on your head, Leanne replied with childish impatience. You can't get a headache in your knuckle. 
I can too, Leanne, Adam insisted. Mommy always pats me on the head and calls me a little knucklehead. You can easily see, by the way Adam reacted to being lovingly called Mommy's little knucklehead, that it would be very easy to put negative thoughts into the minds of our children because they are so trusting and believing. The point I want to make here is that these trusting young minds are perfect for laying a strong foundation of spiritual values. It's absolutely crucial that you begin during these early years to develop your child as a whole person. Only the whole person can develop into a happy, responsible adult who will carry your spiritual values with him. Our children are very sensitive to the responses they receive from us. They know when we are telling them something just to keep them quiet. They sense that we're not really interested in them at that moment. As your child begins to mature to the point of not needing parental help with basic daily tasks, such as dressing or bathing, it's very easy for you to fill this time slot with other jobs. The danger here is that soon you will find yourself spending less and less time with your child. Finding time in today's hectic world is difficult, sometimes seemingly impossible, but you must do it. You must steal away a little time each day for your child, even if it means giving up something that you wanted just for yourself. Today, more than any other time in history, children are being influenced by forces outside the family. Children just naturally want to learn. If you don't take the time or think you don't have the time to teach them, they will learn from someone else. They can be easily influenced by negative experiences outside the home. A good way to teach your child is to share your daily life with him. Make the stories fit his maturity level, and share with your child events in your life as they happen. In this way, your child can learn through your experiences and will more readily adopt your value system. When you turn to God with your problems, let your child know the results of your prayers. Help him understand the comfort you receive by praying. This is an easy way for him to see God working in your daily life. It is vital to the quality of your child's life that you spend time with him during his young years, when he's so willing and pliable. It is a time when he is more positive in his attitude toward you. It is the very best time to teach him spirituality. Early learning experiences remain with children throughout their lifetimes. And if you are consistent and caring and always giving your child unconditional love, he is well on his way to becoming a strong, self-confident teenager and adult. Recently, an acquaintance of mine took a college course on the Old Testament. It had been 40 years since she had attended summer Bible school as a child, but what she had learned 40 years earlier had stayed with her. One requirement on the course's final exam was to list the names of the Old Testament books and list the Ten Commandments. All this information was still with her from her Bible school lessons so long ago because her mind was so pliable and receptive when it was first presented to her. Parental spiritual values imparted to young children will stay with them over the years. I'm reminded of the story of a POW from the Vietnam War who spent seven years in captivity in North Vietnam. As the weeks dragged into months, he began to pull Bible verses and hymns from his memories of Sunday school just to keep his mind busy. Soon, this daily mental exercise helped him reestablish his relationship with God. This young captain had not been a practicing Christian as an adult, but his background of Christian teachings sustained him through seven years of imprisonment. The atmosphere surrounding the learning experience plays a great part in how well the information is received and retained. Children who are taught in a loving atmosphere not only remember the messages, but usually can tell you something about the person or the location involved. Focused attention in a loving atmosphere develops self-esteem, which is extremely important to the overall well-being of your child. You just can't give him too much positive, loving attention. If your child knows that he is loved, he is sure to want to follow your example throughout his life because of his respect for you. So you must be very careful to be a good model in every area of his life, not just the spiritual area. Chapter 8. Teenagers Know Much More Than You Think When your child becomes a teenager, the day of reckoning is at hand. If you have consistently given him unconditional love and good examples, your responsibility to your budding adolescent will be much easier. 
Continue being a good example and keep his emotional tank full. These things, coupled with firm guidelines and patience, will see you and your child through the next four to five difficult years. Your teenager is no longer the child who believes in every word you say and every move you make. Even though you have surrounded him with unconditional love, he is still going to question you. This is where firm, loving rules and patience come in. Your teen is going to question you because the Creator gave him the drive to establish his own identity. By the time your child is an adolescent, he knows exactly how you think and what you think. He knows that you want him to adopt your spiritual values. He knows that you want him to make good grades. He knows what makes you angry, and he knows what makes you glad. Nagging your teenager about anything you want him to do will only succeed in making him angry. The angrier he becomes, the less likely he will be to do what you want. Your best option is to set firm rules that all in your household can live with and help your teen abide by these rules. For instance, homework must be done before bedtime. Your teen knows that. The worst thing you can do is start reminding him every half hour that he should do his homework. Telling him every few minutes that he must do his homework is like telling him that the earth is round. He already knows it, and he's going to get mighty tired of hearing it. If you've been taking an authoritarian approach to your teenager's schoolwork and switch to a more authoritative one, he might not pick up on the responsibility of doing his homework immediately. A dead time will occur when neither your teen nor you is taking the responsibility. Your teen's grades may go down initially, but stand firm and be patient. When your teen finally realizes that his grades are his responsibility, he will assume that responsibility. In this area, the 25 percenters and the 75 percenters are really different. The 75 percenter will feel no pressure, but do only what he has to to get by. The 25 percenter, on the other hand, will tend to simply pick up the total responsibility for his homework without an argument. Take my David, my 75 percenter, for example. He is a bright young man, no learning disabilities, and yet during his 7th, 8th, and ninth grades, he made no better than average grades. But I didn't pressure him, because I knew that one day that kid was going to have to take the responsibility for his own grades. Like a classic 75 percenter, he maintained a grade average just high enough to allow him to participate in sports and other extracurricular activities. Then one day his sister asked, David, have you decided where you're going to college? No, not yet, he replied with little apparent interest. Shortly thereafter, a friend, who was a senior at the time, told David that he was going to Yale the following year. Hey, that's great. What kind of grade average do you have to have to get in there? Oh, about 3.5, his friend answered. At that point, David looked at his report card and saw a GPA of 2.2. This went on for a couple of semesters, and a few more of his senior friends began discussing where they were going to college. David began to realize on his own that he was going to have to take the responsibility of improving his grades if he was going to get to do what he wanted to do in life. Whammo! The grades started inching upward. He now makes good grades, and hopefully will for the rest of his life. That's how most 75 percenters learn responsibility. And it's the same pattern with spirituality, exactly the same. The danger in teenagers knowing how and what we think is that we can transmit our negative attitudes to them just as easily as they learn our positive values. For example, how do you accept failure when it happens to you, your spouse, or your child? Far too often, failure is seldom discussed in today's families. A typical reaction to failure is evident in the following story. Ryan's aunt had stopped by for a visit, and his mother proudly told her Ryan's grades. He made an A and two Bs, she told Aunt Janice. We're so proud of those grades. But, Mom, I also made a... But Ryan couldn't finish his sentence because his mother interrupted him. Ryan, would you mind getting your Aunt Janice more coffee? It's in the kitchen. What Ryan wanted to say was that his mother hadn't read the full report card. He had a C on it, too. In Ryan's home, failure is not discussed. We gleam with pride when we discuss family and individual accomplishments, but little is said about failures. Keeping in mind that teenagers know exactly what we think and what we expect of them 
Shouldn't we expect them to learn to accept failure as well as success as a fact of life? One very athletic, accomplished father brought me a very unhappy, withdrawn, and depressed 14-year-old son. He won't try anything anymore, the obviously self-confident father told me. The boy stood head down beside his father. Come on in and sit down. Do you like sports, Don? No, I'm not very good at any kind of sports. I played baseball for a while, but didn't do so hot. He just quit, his father broke in. I told him that he could never succeed in anything if he kept on being a quitter. I looked at the father and said, I'd like to talk to Don alone for a while. Would you mind waiting for him? I directed Don's father to the waiting room. Tell me, Don, I inquired, how do you and your father get along? Not very well, Dr. Campbell. You know, I can't seem to do anything right as far as he's concerned. It's not that he's mean about it. It's just that he doesn't want me to fail. He just throws up his hands and walks away when I do something wrong. Tell me something you like, Don. Not necessarily something that your father would like you to do, but something that you like. He looked up at me with tears in his eyes and said, I love to play the piano, but I don't think I'm very good at it. At least my dad never takes the time to listen to me. He wants me to play ball, and I hate it. Don, I know that your father loves you very much. I know that, because he wouldn't have brought you to visit me if he didn't care for your well-being. The sad part about Don's dad is that he was losing in one of the most important jobs of his life, the job of being a father. It took some time, but eventually this single parent began to realize what he was doing. I love that boy so much, Dr. Campbell, that I just can't stand to see him fail, he told me recently. I don't want him to have to go through the hurt. But you see, Dave, I said to him, if you accept Don's failures and allow him to do the same, soon he will understand that winning isn't all there is to life, and he'll be able to drop the guilt he feels when he loses. After all, sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. With this attitude, Don can soon begin to feel positive about himself and develop more of an adventurous, I can't wait to see what's out there, outlook on life. After a few weeks of counseling, Don's depression began to lift, and his father Dave began to understand his own feelings about failure. Together, they learned to add a touch of humor to some of the losing situations in which they found themselves. Our Father in Heaven accepts us with all our faults, and we must do the same for our children. Our teenagers know that we want them to win, but we must also let them know that we want them to be happy with themselves. They would never enjoy the exhilaration of winning if they could not measure it against a failure or two. Keeping up an honest, open line of communication is one of the best ways to help your teen abide by your rules. Your teenager many times wants to talk with you about everything and anything. He just doesn't know how to get started. He sometimes wants to talk about moral issues, including sexual morality, faith, and family closeness. He values your input above peer input. He just doesn't know how to go about letting you know this. I have found the very best place for talking is in a car. Every time our family takes a vacation, my teenagers and I get into some interesting conversations. I just ride along saying nothing. If there's anything a teen gets uneasy about, it's silence especially when a parent says nothing. Soon he starts talking. If you are patient enough and just answer his questions, not taking on a preachy attitude, he will soon get to the real reason he started the conversation. Vacations are wonderful times to get acquainted with your teenager. Your teenager is a very interesting person, a person who needs his parents' love and attention but will not ask for it, a person who loves to have his mother tuck him into bed at night, but will defend to the death his right for privacy in his room. A person who refuses his father's offer to help him write the speech he's going to give during his bid for class presidency, but finds his way to his parents' room when the lights are out and timidly asks, Dad, do you have a minute? I want to ask you about a couple of things. A very wise minister accepted the challenge of giving a baccalaureate address. He stood before the high school graduating class and said, I really like teenagers. They are some of the finest people I know. I'm not going to stand here and tell you the world is out there just for the asking, or it's tough out there, but you can do it, or life is what you make it. You already know all that. I'm simply going to say that I have faith in you. I know you will make a few mistakes, 
but I also know that you'll make a lot of right decisions. One of you could be president. Another could own a large business. But more than that, what I want for each of you is to be happy with who and what you are. And I pray to God that this will be your main achievement. We must not treat our teens like little children. They know far more about us and the world than we imagine. They are also still learning and seeking their way. Be open to their questioning. Listen to them with respect for their opinions. Admit it when you don't know something, and then say, let's try to find the answer together. Allow your teen to grow as he questions and seeks to become more independent. If you have allowed him to be himself and to become what God wants him to be, he will be way ahead of the game in his own child-rearing. Chapter 9. Negativism Will Boomerang on You Negative Christianity Sounds like a contradiction of terms, doesn't it? All too often, Christian parents use such negative approaches to teaching spiritual values to their children that they do more harm than good. Christian youth leaders have this same problem. Steve came right out of seminary to church youth ministry. Unfortunately, when he first arrived, he didn't know how to reach adolescents. Steve is a very moralistic 25 percenter. Developing leadership qualities is more difficult for 25 percenters, so you can imagine some of the problems they would have leading a group of teens. One of Steve's first encounters with his church youth group illustrates his dilemma. Steve had invited the teens over to his home. As he stepped out onto the porch, he overheard several young people gossiping about a new member in the group. I angered immediately, went back into the house to get my Bible, and proceeded to give them a long lecture, Steve told me later. I was determined to teach these kids about love and respect for other people. How did they react to that, Steve, I asked. Did they decide that they would never gossip again and thank you for the advice? Of course they didn't. These kids are naturally somewhat anti-authority because they are teenagers. The party ground to a screeching halt. They all kept quiet for the rest of the evening, a classic adolescent reaction. Steve would have been much farther ahead if he had known some basics about the personalities of youth. To be harsh and negative with a kid that age, or any kid for that matter, will accomplish little. We must learn to be firm but pleasant, consistent but positive. These rules apply to every age group, but are magnified a thousandfold with 13 through 15 year olds. Steve shouldn't have been so negative and harsh. The kids already knew that they shouldn't gossip. How many times had they heard that before? Telling them not to gossip just made his youth group angry or left some of them with feelings of guilt. He made a negative statement and he lost them. What he needed to do was to handle the situation meekly. Meekness doesn't mean weak or wimpy. Meekness means withholding your power. Christ was all-powerful, but he always held it in reserve. That is the way we want to interact with teenagers. We have the power, but we don't have to use it. You see, once we have used our power, then we have nothing. There's no longer any reason for them to respect us. Steve used his power, and the kids lost respect for him. If he had just held his power in reserve and been pleasant, things would have been different. You see, the opposite of passive-aggressive behavior is learning to take personal responsibility. You cannot expect kids to grow out of the passive-aggressive stage and take responsibility for themselves unless you give them the opportunity. Anytime you start yelling or lecturing or become negative with your child or teenager, you are preventing him from taking responsibility for his own behavior. As a parent, you cannot force your values on your child, especially when he becomes an adolescent. Unconditional love and development of the whole child is the only way to keep him free from inappropriate anger, so that when he reaches adulthood, he will want to adopt your values. The responsibility will be his whether or not to follow your spiritual beliefs. The main theme of Christian child-rearing experts of today is parental power. I'm not saying that parents should not be in control and should not set rules. I am saying that parental control should be based on love and understanding. When my wife Pat and I lived in California, I met a man who said he and his wife were agnostics. They didn't believe that anyone could know God or His great love. 
They didn't even believe in love. He explained to me that love between a man and a woman was nothing more than physical attraction. He defined parental love simply as nature's way of assuring continuation of the species. One afternoon, when their child was still an infant, Charles and I were talking. You know, Ross, he said, Meg and I believe there is no such thing as love. But when we hold that baby, we get the strangest feelings. They are quite difficult to describe. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I talked to him about God's love for man, and of man's love for his fellow man. But he just didn't want to hear about it. A few months later, we happened to see each other again, and Charles had quite a revelation to share with me. Ross, do you remember when I told you about the feelings Meg and I didn't understand when we held our baby? Well, we know what they are. They are love. He went on to explain how he and Meg began to feel an emptiness in their lives. They joined a group that was starting a Christian church in their neighborhood. How about your son's spiritual life, Charles, I asked. Are you still going to let him make that decision on his own? Well, we won't force him into anything. We hope he will see how Meg and I feel about our faith and follow our example. Parents with a mistaken liberal attitude of non-influence can do as much damage to children as parents who try to force their spiritual beliefs on their children. It is dangerous to leave young people totally void of spiritual values. Luke chapter 6, verse 49 tells us what will happen if we do not give our children a foundation of unconditional love and if we do not allow them to see us live our faith daily. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. As children enter the teen years, when they naturally become anti-authority about everything, spirituality is one more thing they question. God placed in these wonderful young people the desire to question authority. So how can this desire be wrong? If you squelch this natural need in 75 percenters and only give them the doctrine of an angry God who will strike them down at any given moment, you will lose these kids for sure. This same doctrine taught to 25 percenters will frighten them make them feel guilty, and in many cases, if it is strong enough, will do serious psychological damage. Children and teens need to know the loving, forgiving God as well as the God of justice and righteousness. Sixteen-year-old Brian Starks was brought to me by his parents. Brian's parents were unusually strict. They demanded that Brian and his fourteen-year-old brother Brady attend every church function with them. As I began to counsel this family, I learned that Brady was an extreme 75 percenter. I could see that he was doing what his parents asked of him concerning church attendance, but I couldn't help but wonder if the Starks knew what was in store for them when Brady got a little older. Gradually, Brian poured out his story. You see, Dr. Campbell, I've always been jealous of Brady. He seems to be able to do anything. He's smart, and he's quite a runner. I guess that's where the trouble started. A couple of weeks before the big spring track meet, Brady began to tease me. He knows I'm not an athlete. He just kept on teasing me. I prayed that Brady would get hurt somehow, just enough to keep him out of the meet. Two days later, he was in a car wreck and broke his leg. I felt awful. I knew that God was going to punish me for causing Brady to break his leg. It was right after that that I began to see the grim reaper at my bedroom door. I thought that God had sent him to take me because of how I felt about Brady. It was awful. Brian suffered severe emotional damage because of the God will punish you if you don't attitude at home. It will take some time to help him through this, but I have hopes. His 25 percenter personality, coupled with low self-esteem and a negative approach to Christianity, has cost him a great deal. It is all too easy to veer into over-strict and over-permissive methods of dealing with your children. As I suggested to Steve, the youth minister, when you're tempted to lower the boom, just cool it and change the subject. Don't get all bent out of shape at their negative actions. The more negative reaction they get from you, the more negative action they will give you. Relax, fellow parents. Enjoy your precious teenager, the negative and the positive. It won't be long until you'll have a young adult in your house who will say, Hey, how about me driving to church today? 
and treating you all to dinner out afterward. Chapter 10. Special Children Can Be Helped James was a happy little kid. From the time he was born through his seventh year, he didn't appear to have any unusual problems. To the casual observer, he was an average, everyday kid. What no one realized was that he was memorizing everything in order to get through each school day. But James' mother is a very sensitive person. She knew that something was wrong with her child. She just couldn't find anyone who would agree with her and tell her what it was. Toward the end of the second grade, James began to be hard to manage. He often accused his mother of not really loving him. He argued with her constantly. She never felt that she was really communicating with him in a comfortable maternal child bonding way. When James entered the third grade, he started having academic problems. He just couldn't keep up with the other kids because learning was going from general concepts into an abstract level. James just couldn't seem to understand. He was still trying to memorize everything, and as a consequence, his grades started going down. James' concentration power waned. He couldn't remember simple tasks. He became a behavior problem at school and at home. He barely made it through third grade. When the fourth grade started, he just couldn't keep up. His behavior worsened. He became more defiant and harder to manage. He began to have temper tantrums. At this point, his parents brought him to me for counseling. After we evaluated him, we found a very depressed child with extremely low self-esteem. He was self-critical and felt unconsciously that nobody cared about him, that nobody really loved him. He was filled with pent-up anger, especially toward authority. That passive aggressiveness was exhibiting itself in misbehavior toward the number one authority in his life, his parents, and toward lower authorities, his school teachers. There were several reasons why James' grades were going down. Number one, he had perceptual problems. The information coming into his mind as it was processed became somewhat distorted. Therefore, his studies were confusing him. Secondly, he was depressed and depression can either create or intensify a learning problem because concentration is so difficult for a depressed person. Thirdly, he was handicapped due to his passive-aggressive behavior. He was getting back at authority by unconsciously making poor grades. We began treating James for depression. We counseled his parents to deal with his anger by encouraging him to get it out from inside where it was destroying him. And after taking these steps, we got him the academic help he needed. After about four or five months of therapy, he was doing well. His behavior was improved, and for the first time in his life, he was able to be an affectionate child. For the first time, his parents could really manifest their love toward him, and he could accept it. He was beginning to develop a positive self-image. We involved an educational therapist in James' treatment to take away the passive-aggressive anti-learning attitude that had grown within him. She got him into the special education programs that he needed. She helped his teachers understand how to help him feel good about himself and continue his positive attitude toward academics. With his anger subsiding and his depression lifting with therapy, James became less passive-aggressive and less anti-authority. Now, for the first time, he became pliable and receptive to spiritual values and teaching. Children with perceptual handicaps or chronic medical problems have the same problems as average children. The sad thing about these children is that along with the normal everyday problems, they must deal with their own particular handicap. These children are usually quite depressed. Depression is the one thing that we desperately want to avoid in all children and teenagers. Depression produces anger, and angry children are much more likely to be passive-aggressive. When we take this already depressed and passive-aggressive child and superimpose the normal depression and normal passive-aggressive behavior of adolescence, we have a kid who is profoundly depressed and profoundly passive-aggressive. Long before we can teach spirituality to this child, we have to help him through his anger and depression. We have to try to understand his particular problem and let him know that we love him unconditionally. Then, and only then, are we on the road to helping him understand his need for a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. 
Unfortunately, many people think the perceptually handicapped child is lazy or stubborn or just plain dumb. They do not understand that the child does not perceive or take information from his environment through his senses to his mind in the same way that an average child does. This child's understanding of the world around him is distorted due to a neurological problem usually present from birth. Imagine the child's dilemma. He has trouble academically, which creates anger in him. This anger is created from two sources. The child himself, because he cannot understand the work, and the parent who nags him because he's not doing the work. Therefore, he doesn't feel understood or loved by his parents, causing more anger and depression. He doesn't get along with his peers, so the end result is an extremely depressed child. By the time he reaches adolescence, this depression will likely result in severe behavioral and emotional disorders. All too often, a perceptually handicapped child has great difficulty understanding our positive feelings for him. For this reason, he needs extra helpings of love, physical contact, and focused attention from the important people in his life. Not only does the handicapped child experience pain and frustration, but so do his parents. They usually run through a whole gamut of emotions before they can come to grips with the fact that their child is suffering from learning disabilities. The problems of most perceptually handicapped children can be minimized if they are caught soon enough. Catching the problem in time means catching it before the child becomes an adolescent. When the problem remains untreated by the age of 13, 14, or 15, the child usually experiences much more than academic difficulties. His problems almost always include drugs, sex, lying, stealing, running away, and even suicide attempts. Chronic medical problems can also create emotional and behavioral controversies. We can become so involved in the daily physical needs of a chronically ill child that we overlook his emotional needs. As physically impaired children grow older, they become increasingly bitter about their disease or handicap. They become angry with caring parents because the parents have inadvertently replaced the natural giving of love with daily medical attention. These kids can become defiant, not only toward their parents, but toward all authority. Take Linda Walker, who her mother described to me as a fussy baby from the beginning. When she was three, the pediatrician discovered that she had a chronic heart defect. From then until now, our life with her has been one trip after another to specialists. How was her physical health at the present, I asked the Walkers. It's stabilized right now, Paul Walker answered, but her pregnancy certainly won't help her any. I see you have one other child, a son, I noted as I scanned their file. How is his health? Oh, it's just perfect, Mrs. Walker answered. We're so proud of Jeff. He's a fine athlete and quite an accomplished pianist. Has Linda ever developed any hobbies? No, her father answered. We've been so busy attending to her health problems that we never had the time to do much else with her. She's always been such a cranky child that we never could talk her into doing anything other than going to school. And now, here she is pregnant. I guess it's too late. We've done all we know to do, Dr. Campbell, but we surely went wrong someplace. She's been very depressed lately, her mother added. Why don't both of you wait outside and let me talk with Linda, I suggested, as I ushered the walkers toward the door. When Linda began to open up, my suspicions were confirmed. She was a classic example of a chronically ill child whose parents spent so much time caring for her physical needs that they forgot about her emotional needs. Jeff can do this. Jeff can do that. That's all I ever heard. Let's go to Jeff's ball game, Linda. It'll do you good to get out of the house. And you should see the grades Jeff makes. Straight A's. I made C's, and I think that's plenty good enough. I've just started counseling with Linda, but I feel she can be helped with her depression. I know that her parents love her. They didn't realize that they had been substituting emotional attention with medical attention. Linda's low grades in her pregnancy both were subconscious acts of defiance against this seeming indifference. Parents of chronically ill children feel such pity and sometimes even blame and guilt that they do not try to normally control the child's behavior. This results in a manipulative child who will use his illness to control his parents. If the problem is detected and help is obtained in time, both the parent and the child will benefit beyond measure. The child will not only be able to handle academics, but will be able to feel worthy of the love of his parents and friends. 
Chapter 11, The Deteriorating Family. Mark Johnson and his lovely wife Brenda sat across from me. Mark is an attorney. Brenda is the owner and operator of a fashionable children's clothing store. Both Mark and Brenda are Sunday school teachers and are active in a large church. All outward indications give them the mark of a very successful couple. They have two children, a daughter Amy, age 6, and a son Todd, age 11. So why are they in my office? Dr. Campbell, we need to talk to you about Todd. Six months ago, he seemed to change from a normal boy into a quiet stranger who was angry all the time. He constantly found excuses to stay away from us, Brenda began. Yes, Mark agreed, and you'd think that the kids would appreciate the time we give them because we work such long hours. Amy hasn't given us any trouble, but Todd is a different story. A few nights ago, some of his older friends brought him home drunk. What in the world would make an 11-year-old kid who has everything do such a thing? We were shocked beyond words, added Brenda. He's disrupted the entire household schedule with this silly trick. Mark had to reschedule his clients, and I'm taking time away from the store to keep this appointment with you. We want to help Todd, but we can't understand why this happened. We've given him everything, and this is the way he thanks us. What is wrong with our boy, Dr. Campbell? Mark asked. What is wrong? Why would an 11-year-old boy use alcohol on a regular basis? I found as I counseled the Johnsons that Todd had used alcohol many times, but was able to conceal it from his parents before now. My answer is that his family life is not what it should be. His parents are too busy to make special time for their children. Todd was receiving little or no nurturing. As a consequence, he succumbed to negative peer pressure for attention and acceptance. Mark and Brenda Johnson are so busy with their careers that they don't even know where their son is. They put up a front of perfect parents. They are successful financially. They are active in their church. And they have two lovely but very unhappy children. Christian parents sometimes rationalize their absence from their children by taking them to church and Sunday school every Sunday. In so doing, they think they are filling the spiritual needs of their children, but they are not. Young people like Todd Johnson are too angry to accept any kind of spiritual teaching. They feel unloved and try to get back at their parents in any way they can. Todd Johnson chose to experiment with alcohol. Spending time with your family, getting to know your children, telling them you love them, and letting them know they are important to you, these are the important issues. It doesn't really matter what we do or exactly how we measure the time we spend with our children. We can play basketball or go shopping or just go for a ride, as long as we let our children know that they are loved and that they are worth conquering the outside and inside influences that tend to separate parents and kids. Loving time shared by a family add to the strength of the individuals and the family as a unit. If I ask you to recall a happy personal family experience, what would it be? Maybe you remember a time when your mother made doll clothes for you, or a long walk you took with your dad. Perhaps an 11th birthday party, or a special family joke comes to mind. All of these memories add to your sense of security and acceptance, and most are of simple times, made special by the love and togetherness of the people involved. What can you do as a Christian parent to prevent your family from falling apart? There are no simple, pat answers to this question. As I counseled with Mark and Brenda Johnson and Todd, they began to find ways to change some of their habits. Mark discovered that if he could take time out to attend counseling sessions with his son, he could surely take time to enjoy his son. Mark and Brenda began to allow the teachings of their faith to show in their daily lives. It takes time to correct the old established patterns, but the Johnsons are determined to make a better life for themselves and their children. They learned how to give the love that they felt deep inside for Todd and Amy, but didn't take time to show. Look at your children as individual whole beings. Don't merely satisfy their desires for material things and then expect them to grow properly. Don't take them to church on Sunday and then leave spiritual values out of their lives the rest of the week. Be mindful, too, of your child's emotional needs. If he is not loved, he cannot feel worthy of anything else you give him or try to teach him. 
Be willing to make sacrifices for each other. Exhibit unconditional love. Become genuinely involved in interests of family members. All these things help unify family life. Not long ago, I read the story of a devout Christian family, a young seminary student who recognized how much his mother had influenced all the family in a very positive way, wrote her, asking her methods of educating and training her children. He wanted to impart this information to the young parents to whom he was ministering. This woman, who raised ten children to adulthood, wrote back that her main goal was to teach her children to respect God and each other. But the most important thing that this mother did for her children was to set aside a special hour for each of them on an individual basis. She recognized the child's need to spend time alone with her. Her husband was gone a great deal, so it was up to her to see to the spiritual and emotional needs of her children. She also taught Sunday school and led devotions, besides caring for her large family on a daily basis. Is it any wonder that the seminary student's son was proud of his mother and wanted to share her methods with his parishioners? And his mother was truly rewarded by the Christian lifestyle of her son, for his name was John Wesley, and she was Susanna Wesley. Their correspondence took place in 1732. Susanna Wesley knew instinctively then what I'm suggesting to you today. Develop the child's whole personality and give him focused attention. I know it's difficult. I know parents tire. There have been many times when I would have found it much easier to fall asleep on the sofa than attend a football or baseball game, but I was always glad I went to the games. If you don't work to keep your family together, your children will not have a good example to follow when they try to establish their own families. The love and respect you give to your children will be returned a hundredfold. By the same token, the damage received in an unloving family will manifest itself over and over in families to come. Raising a child is like throwing a small stone into a still pond. The results of how you treat or mistreat your child will echo for years and years into countless families just as the rings from that stone ripple across the water. Whether it be play or work, the time you spend with your child is priceless. Then and only then can you get to know him and offer him your love and understanding. Chapter 12, Common Sense and Child Rearing Al and Brad Stockman eased their dad's car into the garage. If dad sees us coming home this late, we're dead, Brad said to his brother. The first time we get to take the car out, and here we're two hours late getting back. The boys crept up the back steps, carefully opened the door, and tiptoed halfway across the kitchen. Suddenly, the room was flooded with light. Oh, no, Al exclaimed. Dorothy and Jack Stockman had been waiting up for the boys. Well, boys, their father began, it seems you are a little past your curfew. Dorothy Stockman wrapped her blue house coat more closely around her shoulders. Are you two okay? Where in the world have you been? We've been worried about you. That's so dumb, Mom, Al growled. Gosh, I'm 16 years old and you're treating me like a baby. We really couldn't help it, Brad interrupted. We came out of the theater in time to be home at 11, but the rear right tire on the car was completely flat. I'll handle this, Brad, Al snapped at his younger brother. Turning to his father, he said, Yeah, and when we opened the trunk to get the spare, it was flat too. Then we had to call a tow truck so that we could get the car to a station and air up the tire. I thought he'd never get there, and then the man at the station was as slow as molasses. It wasn't our fault that he took so long. You're right, Al. It wasn't your fault, Jack Stockman agreed. But surely you knew that your mother and I would be concerned when you didn't arrive home on time. Why didn't you call us and let us know what was going on? I didn't think it was any big thing, Al retorted. We're home and everything is okay. Yes, boys, you're home and everything is fine. But your mother and I didn't know everything was fine an hour ago. I think two weeks without the privilege of driving that car will help you remember to let us know when things like this happen. Let's get to bed now. Jack and Dorothy Stockman are fine Christian parents. They know their boys. They've taken the time to get acquainted with each one as an individual. 
they knew to allow Al to vent his anger about the flat tire. They also knew that Brad would probably need to be encouraged to discuss the situation further. So they handled things accordingly. In another family, the same happening might be handled differently, depending on the personalities involved. Outside help is almost always needed when dealing with the spiritual lives of your children, especially your 75 percenters. If you try to guide them toward spirituality by yourself, you stand little chance of success because of their natural tendency to rebel against parental guidance. I go outside our home for help. I've been a Christian for over 30 years and a physician for almost 20. Yet I realize that I cannot lead my children to Christianity all by myself. A church with a good youth leader is an absolute must for teenagers. David, our oldest son, was one of the more difficult kids to bring to Christ. He's a muscular, macho athlete who, like others of his breed, saw Christianity as kid stuff. So when David became an adolescent and developed an anti-church attitude, we were grateful that our youth leader was a former football player, six foot four, weighing well over 200 pounds. He and David became good friends. Who is better qualified to teach a macho kid about Christ than a macho adult? All caring parents love their children, but Christian parents often feel the pressures of child-rearing more than others. They try very hard to do a perfect job. They want the very best for their children. They want them to be accepted in society. And most of all, they want them to mature into fine Christian adults. Many Christian parents feel that their children should be perfectly behaved at all times. They take their responsibility as parents so seriously that in the long run, they damage instead of enhance the lives of their children. You are not perfect. One of the pillars of the Christian faith is that no one is perfect but the Lord himself. That believers have the freedom to fail and to be forgiven is a gift from God. Where you spot weaknesses in your interactions with your children, seek help. An obvious example of parents who think they should raise perfect kids is church leaders. We have all heard of the preacher's kid syndrome. These poor people think they must do everything perfectly and allow no one to see a flaw in their family structure. After all, they are teachers of the Word of God. Children living in this kind of atmosphere really suffer. They are pressured by their parents to lead strict spiritual lives, and their peers in the community exert more pressure on them. 25 percenters in the homes of Christian leaders can be damaged by feelings of guilt and suppressed anger, while the open rebellion of 75 percenters can be spectacular indeed. The wife of a Protestant minister gave me some insight into the life of a preacher's kid. I used to expect my poor children to be the perfect kids every day of their lives. When they were in grade school, I thought it was my moral obligation to have all three of them starched and dressed and seated in the front pew every time the church doors were open. My kids couldn't make noise or be disruptive. The boys are both 25 percenters, and Janet is a 75 percenter. Peter and Kevin were always well-behaved children, but Janet was altogether different. I'm sure the boys often resented the demands I made of them, but they never complained. Janet resented authority from the day she was born. I had quite a time keeping her in line when she was a child, and her entrance into adolescence made me realize that I would have to make some changes in my thinking because Janet wasn't going to change. I wondered if the boys had the same feelings but wouldn't tell me. My husband and I soon realized that we were strangling our children to please everyone in the congregation. We were trying to be the world's ultimate parents. We began to develop an understanding for our children on an individual basis. We knew that we were going to have to let them be just who they were and gently guide them with love and daily examples toward Christianity. Then, instead of doing a complete about-face overnight, we gradually implemented our new lifestyle. I could see them start to relax as we became less rigid and demanding with them. The boys are 17 now, and I think we've gotten through this with relatively few scars. I still have to be careful not to take advantage of their easygoing personalities, but my husband and I have learned a lot. Janet is 14. Helping her through these next few years will be a different story, I'm sure. 
Last Sunday, just before church, Janet strolled into the kitchen still in her pajamas. Shocked at seeing her totally unprepared to leave for church, I blurted out, Why aren't you ready for church? She told me in no uncertain terms that she wasn't going to Sunday school or church. Why, Janet? I asked. The whole thing is boring, Mother, and I'm just plain tired of it. Janet, I said, I'm sorry you feel this way, but I'm glad you told me. My concern is, how will your Sunday school classmates feel when you're not there? You're the leader of that class. Couldn't your absence possibly be letting them down? What do you mean, she asked. Well, for instance, your teacher relies on your knowledge of the Bible. That class is going to be rather quiet without you. I understand that everything gets tiresome once in a while, Janet, I continued, but instead of making a decision this very minute, why don't you think about what I just said? She pondered the problem for just a minute, then jumped up and hurried out of the kitchen. I'd better hurry if I'm going to be ready in time to ride with you, she said. This Christian mother is a perfect example of a parent using common sense. She instinctively knew that an argument with her daughter would have resulted if she had demanded church attendance. She knew that understanding and gentle loving guidance were the only answers. When Carol and her husband finally set aside their worries of what will everyone think, they could really help their children grow as individuals and develop as whole human beings. In turn, their sons and daughter could truly have their emotional, physical, psychological, as well as spiritual needs met. A parent's instinctive reaction cannot be overlooked. Carol knew that she would not be able to come down hard on Janet, and it worked. Never underestimate your instinctive ability to perceive any given situation. If your family really has been getting to know one another in an environment of unconditional love, then instinctively you will be pretty good at reading basic signals of anger, fear, anxiety, and other emotions. I'm not suggesting that you can be 100% in tune with every thought and action of your child. But just a little common sense will many times correct a problem before it becomes a major event. Keep communication flowing within your family. A healthy family takes work. Seek God's help daily. Depend on your common sense. And love your child as God loves us unconditionally. Our inherited and precious faith must be passed on from generation to generation. Many are concerned why we are having severe difficulty in passing it on to the generation of our children and teenagers. There are fine Christian young people developing today, but their numbers and influence are small. Their generation is rejecting what we and our forefathers have held dear. The spiritual battle is being lost in our homes. The hour is late, but not too late. We, with God's help, can reverse this trend by raising and relating to our children and teenagers the right way, to keep their hearts soft and open to a personal relationship to Christ, and to allow God to mold their character and lives. Presently, we are losing the battle. Let's win the war. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation of Ross Campbell's book, How to Really Know Your Child. If so, be sure to look for Dr. Campbell's other books in this series, How to Really Love Your Child and How to Really Love Your Teenager. And there are many other titles in the Audio Echoes series to suit a wide variety of tastes. You'll find them suitable for personal enrichment, motivation, leadership training, and spiritual growth. They also make thoughtful gifts. Included in the Audio Echoes books on cassette series are authors such as Evelyn Christensen, Tony Campolo, David Siemens, Paul Little, Gene Getz, Warren Wearsby, and Stuart Briscoe. Additional audio echoes are being released on a regular basis, so keep your ears open for new book cassettes of interest to you. Look for audio echoes in your local Christian bookstore, or for a complete list of up-to-date titles, please write Vista Media, 1825 College Avenue, Wheaton, Illinois, 60187. Each of these cassettes is also available in book form, and many of the books have an accompanying leader's guide for group study. Thanks again for listening to this selection from the Audio Echo series. Music